Week two, Beyond Belief. We are going to dig into Christian apologetics once again today. I want to start by telling you a story of the late atheist Christopher Hitchens. Christopher Hitchens, one of the most outspoken atheists of this past century, uh, he was being interviewed by the press some years ago. And he was telling journalists that he had just discovered that our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, was on a collision course with the Andromeda galaxy. And it was anticipated that when these two galaxies come together, it will spell absolute disaster for both massive star clusters. He mentioned a timeline. He said this was to happen in 3.9 billion years. 3.9 billion years till this apocalyptic scenario was realized. Then he went on to explain that this is just another indication that there is no God. After all, what kind of God would create a universe in which sentient beings like us live and that galaxy that they live in was going to collide with another galaxy? Now, after he'd explained this, one of the journalists raised a hand and queried him. She obviously was anxious. She said, did you say 3.9 million years? And he quickly corrected her. No, 3.9 billion years. To which the journalist, in all seriousness, breathed an exasperated sigh of relief while clutching at her chest and visibly relaxing. A moment of introspection went by before the crowd burst out laughing. The concern difference between 3.9 million and 3.9 billion being relatively insignificant. Now, whether it be billions of years or millions of years or thousands of years or hundreds of years, decades or days, there is definitely a terror in the non-Christian, the non-believer, at the prospect of annihilation. Whether annihilation of our galaxy, our planet, our species, or even personal annihilation, it's the prospect, I think, of being something which becomes nothing. That unnerves people. And why not? Well, if you think about it, it doesn't make sense if you're a non-believer. I mean, why should it matter if you're headed toward nothing? After all, if all we are is matter, if all we are is sacks of chemistry wandering around who believe that they exist, why should it matter if we are headed toward imminent destruction? Well, I think the reason this nothingness, this collective oblivion terrifies people, I think the reason that that is the case is because for some, we have this belief, this absurd belief, this strange belief that we were meant for eternity. That somehow we're not merely matter, that for some reason or another that we are supposed to live forever, we are forever things. Now, for the Christian, this makes sense, but for the non-Christian, this is kind of an irrational state of mind. It would be a pervasive delusion, right? I mean, after all, we're headed for imminent destruction. Why should anyone feel a wrongness about this potential nothing? Here's what I found, though. People are not just terrified at the prospect of annihilation. But people are a little bit uncomfortable with the idea that we came from a nothing. The idea that at some stage in history, there was nothing and then there was everything. That unnerves some people. Now, for the non-theist in the know, this is the only game in town. But for you and I as Christians, we don't believe that we came from nothing and are going to nothing. What's more, there's an even more fascinating question. If this universe emerged from nothing and it's headed toward an imminent annihilation, if entropy guarantees that all heat will basically spread indefinitely until we die what's called the heat death and matter ceases to be usable, if we are bookended from nothing and nothing, the more interesting question is why on earth in the middle is this elaborate something existing? How very strange. This is the question we'll be addressing today. Before we dig into it, let's go to our Lord in prayer. Our Lord and Master, our God. Father, in the, in the book of James, James told us that if any of us lacks wisdom, that we should ask. And so God, right now, because we're going to deal with a, a kind of a difficult topic, it's simple, but it's difficult. Lord, I, I ask that you would just open our minds up to understanding. Father, fill us with your Holy Spirit. And God, I pray that um, both I, as somebody who's speaking, that Lord, you would speak through me and past me if necessary. And Lord, that you would be with the ears of those who are hearing with the hearts and minds of those who are listening, that they would do the hard work of listening and applying. God, we want to learn from you today, and we want to uh, learn not just from, from the, the book, the scriptures that you gave us, but we also want to learn from the book of creation 
and see you through the natural world. Lord, to that end, make us aware. We love you, O God. It's in your name we pray. Amen. A comedian was discussing people griping. He said, uh, it's the strangest thing. You get on a plane, and uh, he says, you're on a plane, and you're traveling across a continent in a matter of hours. And people are griping and moaning because the Wi-Fi is not quite working the way we wanted it to. And he's like, it's so absurd. We, we, we have just everything. Just, it's wonderful. And, and yet people are just disenchanted. It's like we just expect these miracles every day. He said, every one of us, when we're on a plane, should just be gripping the seat the whole time going, whoa, whoa, I'm in a tube of metal in the sky. I am engaged in the miracle of human flight, but people aren't that way. We tend to experience wonderful things all the time, and yet the amazement just bypasses us. We take them for granted. You don't have to get into a plane to be amazed. To be filled with wonder, all you need to do is stop for a moment and be seriously introspective about any aspect of this life. Just stop and begin thinking meditate and become deep on some issue you'll find yourself amazed when when was the last time you were amazed when is the last time you experienced the world and went whoa what is happening right now was it when you sat up in bed this morning or when you looked at yourself in the mirror and you made eye contact with yourself not a cause for amazement with most of us maybe a little bit underwhelming Was it when you took the first sip of coffee this morning, or has it been years? Has it been a long time since anything in this world struck you and you went, wow, this is incredible? Before we begin today, I want to talk briefly about apologetics again, and so let's look at our scripture passage for memory this month. If you guys have your Bibles, I hope that you have begun studying this. We want to memorize one verse at least one per month. And so this month, we're digging into 1 Peter 3.15. 1 Peter 3.15. And uh, I want to give you a quick synopsis of what this verse means after we try this. Ready? Here we go. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. Yet do this with gentleness and reverence okay very quick synopsis of this verse and what it's about this first section sanctify christ as lord in your heart the word sanctify is not a word we use very often it means make holy or set apart and the idea is that before you do anything else that first of all you go christ you are lord here you own this i have you enthroned in the core of who i am and so that's what's being said at the outset and then he says this always be ready to make a defense. And the word defense there in the Greek is apologia. It means to give an answer or to give a defense of. And the idea here is that you and I have to get ready to explain why we believe what we believe. That's why we're doing this right now. I want us to think deeply about why we believe what we believe for the next two months. This week, we're going to do kind of a science-philosophy combo. Next two weeks, we're going to be doing uh, studies specifically in the sciences. So gear up. How many of you had coffee today or some other form of caffeine? Raise them high and proud. Okay, the rest of you are going to regret it. All right. Always be prepared to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet do this with gentleness and reverence. The word hope in Christianity means something different than the way the rest of our world uses the term hope. Hope in the world means something that is unlikely to happen. So I hope I win the lottery, which means I'm not going to win the lottery, but wouldn't that be great if I did, especially because I don't play, all right? That's what hope means in our world. In Christianity, the term hope means an expectation of something that definitely will occur. It is looking forward to something that is going to happen. So be able to explain the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and respect. In other words, don't be a jerk. That's one of the core messages of Christianity. Please don't be a jerk. Be nice to people. Be kind. Be generous. Be genial. Okay. The first question that ought to rightly be asked. Leibniz, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz was a philosopher. 
and a, a Christian philosopher, and he, he has this statement, and this is the core statement of an argument he made called the Leibniz Contingency Argument for the Existence of God. I'm not going to do that argument in detail today. If you want information on that, I'll do that for you another time. That being said, here's what, he, here's what Leibniz said. He said, the first question that should rightly be asked is this, why is there something rather than nothing? Why is there something rather than nothing? Today we're going to talk about nothing for a little while. Now this has all the potential to be one of those terrible, like, who's on first comedy routines. If you're not familiar with the Abbott and Costello comedy routine, who's on first, go watch it on YouTube this week. It's a lot of fun. But here's the deal. We're going to be talking about nothing. And this is what I mean when I say nothing, no thing. So if anybody asked you today, what'd you talk about at church today? You would say, Nothing. And you could say it rightly and laugh and they wouldn't think it was funny. All right. Aristotle gives us a description of what nothing is. Here's what he said. What is nothing? Nothing is that which rocks dream about. Thanks, Aristotle. Nothing is that which rocks dream about. Okay. Nothing is more simple than nothing. Nothing is more simple than nothing. Here's what I mean by that. Do you know what's easier than tying your shoes? Not tying your shoes. Not tying your shoes is easier than tying your shoes. Do you know what's easier than doing algebra? Well, a lot of things. But what's easier than doing algebra is not doing algebra. Do you know what's easier than preparing a meal? Not preparing a meal. Nothing is more simple than doing something. Do you understand? Okay. Do you know what's less complex than an automobile? No automobile. Nothing is more simple than something. Do you know what's less complex than a Pez dispenser? That's a simple thing. No Pez dispenser is less complex than a Pez dispenser. You know what's less complex than a stone? It's just a rock. No stone is less complex than a stone. Nothing is more simple than everything. Do you know what's more simple than the most simple thing you can imagine? Say one electron. One electron is a very simple thing. Do you know what's more simple than that? No electrons. Nothing is more simple and more easy to explain than anything. Nothing is more simple than everything. Now you might be going, why on earth did we do this? And why on earth am I not, did I not drink coffee this morning? Here's the deal. Nothing has no parts to explain. It has no rules to follow. Nothing has no features. It is no thing. Nothing is more simple than nothing. So when anybody asks you what you learned at church today, nothing is more simple than nothing. So why did this universe come into being? How is it that this universe can exist? Why would a complex universe come into being? Now, some of you might be objecting immediately, and you might be thinking, well, who says the universe came into being? Maybe the universe is eternal. Maybe it's just been here forever, and so we have no reason to explain the universe. So if the question is, how does a universe emerge from nothing? Some people say, well, the universe has always been. It's always been here. Let's answer that question then. How has the universe always been here? Has the universe always been? There's a Latin phrase, ex nihilo, nihilo fit. Ex nihilo, nihilo fit. From nothing, nothing comes. From nothing, nothing comes. Why would you expect anything to emerge from nothing? That's absurd. Why should you think that something would emerge from nothing? Uh, so could this universe have not existed? Is there a time where this universe could potentially have not existed? Some of you are nodding. Some of you are like, this is a trick question. Yes, it is fully possible that this universe did not exist. In fact, it is the story of astrophysics over the last half century that we know this universe came into being. All of the best details, all of the best astrophysical work that has been done suggests imminently, strongly, beyond a matter of a doubt, this universe did come into being at some finite point in history. Carl Sagan, um, how many of you guys were around in 1980? Raise your hand if you lived in the 1980s. In the year 1980, there was this special that was on PBS called The Cosmos. And uh, Carl Sagan was hosting it. And this, this movie, or this series on the cosmos, it talked about this universe. And here's what Sagan said in the, the series. This is how it began. He said, the cosmos is all that is, 
or all that was or ever will be. The cosmos is all that is, all that was or ever will be. Then he said this, our feeblest contemplations of the cosmos stir us. There's a tingling in the spine, a catch of the voice, a faint sensation as if distant memory of, of falling from a great height. We know we are approaching the greatest of mysteries. Well, that feels kind of neat. How about that, Carl Sagan? The problem with Sagan's statement is that it's incorrect. And Carl Sagan, even when he uttered it, knew it was incorrect. Sagan was one of many intellectuals in this past century hoping to discover some way that our universe might be permanent in the past. And yet all the discoveries of astrophysics say otherwise. There is a discrete starting point, an absolute starting point to this cosmos, which means that before this cosmos existed, nothing, nothing. This universe had an absolute beginning. This is, by the way, the dominant secular view for explaining everything we see. All the rules, all the substances, all the forms of energy, everything emerged uncaused and out of nothing. If you think that I'm cherry picking phrasing here, let me be very clear. Anthony Kenny, one of the greatest atheists of this past century said it this way. He said a proponent of the Big Bang Theory, at least if he is an atheist, must believe that the universe came from nothing and by nothing. Nothing, everything. So we'll save the question of how a universe emerges for next week, but for right now I wanna answer the question why. Why is a universe here? Why something rather than nothing at all? Would you guys agree with me that the universe is a rather big and complex something? I, I think that it is. So why, why does a universe come into being? Well, some people argue that we shouldn't have to ask. We shouldn't have to answer. That question is unfair, they say. Bertrand Russell, again, one of the greatest atheists of this past century. You guys all know what an atheist means, by the way, right? Let me, atheist means somebody who believes there is no God. So just so we're clear, I'm quoting almost exclusively atheists and agnostics today. I want you to hear these things in the words of people who believe these things. So you know it's not just me kind of sniping at uh, straw men. Here's what uh, Bertrand Russell said. He said, the universe is just there and that's all. The universe is just there and that's all. Doesn't require explanation, it's just there. Uh, William Lane Craig, one of the great Christian uh, philosophers, <laughs> addressed this issue. Here's what he said. He said, imagine you and a friend are walking along in the woods and you suddenly come across a shiny sphere lying on the ground. You would naturally wonder what it is and how it came to be there, and you would think it odd if your friend responded thusly. There is no reason or explanation for it. Stop wondering. It just is. Wouldn't that be strange? You wouldn't likely find that dismissal in any way gratifying. But what if the shiny sphere were bigger? What if it weren't a small shiny sphere? What if it were the size of a skyscraper? Would you then be willing to accept that dismissal? There's no reason to explain it. It just is. Or would you still find it intellectually dishonest? What if that sphere were the size of the cosmos? And here's what he says. What is true of a small shiny sphere is even more true of the universe as a whole. Why is it here? Why are we here? So how do people answer the question, why are we here? Generally, one of three ways. The first way is to say, don't ask. Just don't talk about it, don't ask, don't think about it. And I'm guessing if you go start a conversation with non-believers this week, I, I can almost guarantee you will find many people going, let's not talk about this. Now, why would people respond that way? What is so scary about the question that it causes people to flee when they merely hear it? Could it possibly be that they know where this question will lead? I think so. So here's your option. You can say, let's not talk about it. Or you could, you could say this, we are one cosmic accident. We are one huge, ridiculous blunder. This universe is a series of blunder after blunder after blunder that resulted in this weird scenario where sentient creatures realize they exist and for some reason, they seem to think they have purpose and meaning. That's one option. You, I, we are all part of an enormous blunder. Now, uh, the problem with that is that if, 
if that's the case, then any question of why becomes a nonsense question because we are the result of a nearly innumerable series of cosmic accidents, accidents that allowed for us to exist, but really what can be said of us? We are sacks of plasm and chemicals. There is no meaning, no value in the human experience. And don't take my word for it. Listen to Richard Dawkins describe it. Here's what he said. In a materialistic universe, in a universe that's just made of matter and energy, space and time, in a materialistic universe, there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. This universe does not care about you. It did not intend to make you. There is no intention. There's no real direction or directive save that we're headed toward imminent destruction. In the great cosmic story, you have as much significance as the soil between your toes or a swarm of gnats that is here today and blown away in the wind tomorrow. We are all doomed to an individual and collective extinction. The universe itself will die. All astrophysical evidence agrees on this issue. The universe is headed toward imminent destruction. As William Lane Craig has described it, all the greatest achievements of humanity will be lost amidst a universe in ruin. Who's happy? It was interesting. I got in the car about 5.45 this morning and started driving in here, and guess what came on my playlist? Kansas is dust in the wind. <laughs> if you've ever heard the song, it's fantastic. Uh, I like to think about those, those eminent philosophers describing it this way. Um, you've probably heard of them, Bill and Ted. When they were, talking to, uh, they were talking to Socrates, or as they called him, Socrates, and they're like, all we are is dust in the wind, dude. And he didn't get it, so they scoop up some dust, and they're like, dust in the wind, dude. Right? He's like, oh. That is a great illustration of who and what we are if there is no God behind this, no ultimate purpose or meaning. If all we are is material, this universe came from nothing and is headed to nothing, you and I are totally worthless. No matter how much you try to create your meaning, it's all a delusion. It would be like that gnat we were just talking about that got blown away in the wind. Imagine that gnat could scream out in its little gnat voice and says, I am emperor, but it's dead. Who cares? That is what many people are doing with their lives. This means something, not if you're all headed toward destruction, it doesn't. And I'm not alone in saying that. Again, the, uh, Kai Nielsen, one of the greatest philosophers, atheistic philosophers in history, said this. He said, we must build our lives on the firm foundation of despair. But there's another option. What is the other option? The other option is that this universe was and is intentional. There's a purpose behind it coming into being, but here's the problem with that. In order to have a purpose, you must have one who bestows purpose. You cannot have intention without having intentionality. There must be a mind behind it. Because if it's inanimate, if it's just nothing but a force, nothing but matter, there is no intention, there could never be intention. You wouldn't look at a rock and say, what's that rock up to? What's the meaning of that rock? What's it about? It has no mind. It's not about anything. Even if it's holding down a stack of papers and we're like, that serves a purpose, we're still imputing a meaning to it. It's the observer, it's the mind that describes what meaning is. For us and this universe to have meaning, there must be a mind that forged it. And that is precisely what the gospel portrays. That is precisely what the scriptures convey. There is a God behind all of this. It means something. So what about it? Is this world a colossal accident or was it intentional? Was there meaning and purpose infused into this existence? Let's consider, let's think about the cosmos for just a second. I want to discuss the uncanny cosmos. Uncanny, everyone say uncanny. Uncanny is a great word that we use too seldom. Phenomenal word. Put it in your vocabulary right now. Here it is. Uncanny means being beyond what is normal or expected. Uncanny. Suggesting superhuman or supernatural powers. It's something that is weird, something that is eerie, something that is cryptic, something that is deep, mysterious, strange, fantastic, odd. Uncanny. This universe is uncanny. You know it is. Your life is weird. Let me say that again. Your life is, you might be going, my life is not weird. Yes, it is. Hold up your hand for just a second. Just look at that thing in front of you. That is weird. What kind of odd tool is this? Now, you might not realize it. Go and wiggle your fingers a little bit. 
but there are, there, are, there are electric signals being pushed out of your brain and it's traveling through your body and it's communicating to these muscle groups that something called the power stroke needs to happen where chemicals are infused into a strand of muscle and when it does, they contract and they seize up and it causes you to curl your fingers. And, and that's all happening in a moment, in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, that all occurs. What an odd thing the hand is. Think about anything else. Think about plants for goodness sake. Plants, there's no, what's more simple than a plant? That's not simple. Do you realize that the star in the center of our uh, solar system, it's just puking out massive amounts of energy. Maybe that's not how scientists describe it. But it's, it's, it's gushing forth these massive amounts of energy and that energy is slamming into our planet. And there are these things on our planet that, have, that basically they drink up that energy. They, they turn it into energy within themselves through photosynthesis. And then, and then that energy can be consumed. And so animals around the planet consume it. And some people consume that stuff as well. And then we consume each other. Well, not people, but you know, consume animals. All of this, all of this, we're kind of just in this massive cannibalizing of the sun's energy via plants. That's weird. That's strange. It's uncanny. Beyond that, think about what eating is. I mean, again, you can do this in any direction if you just stop and think. We take matter and we jam it into a hole in our face and, and then we, we grind it into a pulp and liquefy it and then we send it down into our stomach where it, it's hit with acids and enzymes that consume it, and then it goes out and it gets used by all the stuff in our body to become body parts. That's weird. It is all terribly, wonderfully, gloriously strange. It's uncanny. G.K. Chesterton, one of my favorite Christian authors, if you've not read the book Orthodoxy, read the book Orthodoxy, one of the greatest Christian works ever made. G.K. Chesterton says this. He says, It's one thing to describe an interview with a gorgon or a griffin, a creature that does not exist. It's another thing to discover that the rhinoceros does exist and then take pleasure in the fact that he looks as if he doesn't. What a strange animal. If a dragon were in that picture, you'd be like, that's fantastic. But the fact that you've seen a rhinoceros over and over again, you just assume that it is normal. Think about the elephant. If you've ever asked yourself, does God have a sense of humor? He created a creature that can pick up trees with its nose. That is weird. The uncanny world inspires not just questions of what, but questions of why. Why is it this way? What is happening here? The why questions, some people disregard them. Some people set them aside. A lot of people in our world don't want to answer the question why. They prefer what? But if you miss out on the question why, you miss out on the bulk of the experience of being a human. Why draws us toward God? And I think you all know this. Let me, let me illustrate this. Imagine tomorrow morning you wake up and you go to the front door of your house and your spouse is with you, or your kids are with you, and you step out of the front door of your house and as you walk outside onto the porch, you look around and there are 10,000 people in chicken costumes and they're all facing the porch. And you're holding your coffee, and as you look out at them, they were all waiting for you, and they all say, as one, the red crow dies at dawn. You take a sip of your coffee, you turn around, and you go back inside. Now, imagine your spouse, your kids, whoever, they ask you, what was that? Well, answering the question, what, would be, well, I stepped out onto the front porch. There were 10,000 people who appeared to be dressed as chickens. And then they uttered some cryptic phrase. Then I came back in. Does the what question help you? What question do you want an answer to? Why? Why did that just happen? What is going on here? Why is this occurring? The why question is important. Let's consider the why of our universe. I want you to just think about our universe for a little bit. Here we go. We're going to run through a litany of aspects of our universe. This is a universe of order. We're going to dig deeply into this over the coming weeks. Two weeks from now, we'll hit this really hard. This is a universe of exceedingly intricate fine-tuning. Carl Sagan, again, an agnostic, said this, if you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. If you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. Do you know what he means by that? Take the simplest feature of your human experience. There are innumerable 
physical laws that are, come into play that allow that to take place. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of them operating at any given time. There are millions of intricate features that must work together in order for you to do something like baking an apple pie. If you desired to pick your nose right now, and I know you do, if that were your desire, think about all the physical laws that must be in play to bring something like that about. And yet we take them for granted every day. They're operating all the time. Why? We live in a universe that allows for life. Um, when, you, when you assess physical laws, you, you're going to be amazed. If you understand what's there, it's amazing. But when you begin looking at life and what transpires with life, it is mind-blowing. It's incredible. It's uncanny. This universe allows for life. Now, the big question in uh, the life sciences is abiogenesis. How does life emerge from non-life? How do we get any life to begin with? From non-life to life is an enormous leap. It's almost as if it can't happen naturally. Almost as if. Information encrypted into DNA, uh, and again, DNA is one of these things that we've only learned about recently. You know, it's, it, in, in the cosmic scheme of things, we have not known about this very long, but there are double helix strands in your, in your body, they're in every cell in your body, that contain all the information to rebuild every part of who you are. They are encrypted and encoded. They have start and stop sequences. So they tell the body, here's how to make this protein start here, stop here, send it out. And it goes through pathways throughout your body, and it's happening nonstop right now. It should beg the question, why? What is going on? Again, it seems like something really important might be transpiring with life. Um, the former director of uh, prenatal research, uh, there are the Prenatal Research Institute at the University of Cincinnati, is a man by the name of Reginald Tsang. Uh, he's a physician or was a physician in the neonatal unit at Children's Hospital, a dear friend of mine, an amazing Christian, uh, brilliant, brilliant scientist. But here's what he said about the cell. He wrote an article called The Shanghai Cell. Bear with me for just a moment. He said this, just explain to me how the first smallest cell ever came into being by chance. Just one little cell, the one little cell, the most primitive, at least to the uninitiated, cell, is actually as complex as the city of Shanghai. He's not exaggerating. The truly amazing cell is like Shanghai. The simplest cell has the equivalent of phone lines, wireless connections, computer chips, cell phones, emails zipping around inside. There are functions within the cell that serve as policemen, firemen, anti-pollution experts, garbage disposal staff, postmen, gardeners. In the cell, there are features like street signs, traffic lights, superhighways, typhoon and tornado warnings, and fire alarms. And it all works beautifully. No garbage, no pile-ups, no traffic congestion, no plumbing backups, no water shortages, no pollution in the cell, and it never stops working. And can we really imagine 50 trillion, that is 50 times 10 to the 12th power cells in every one of our bodies, or 50 trillion Shanghais in each of us, all working together in an amazing interplay and exchange. Tell me how it all came about chance. One phone line at a time, one water pipe at a time, or one traffic light at a time, or did the master designer in his infinite wisdom and intelligence put together a perfect example of what can go right when all the pieces fit and work perfectly? We have life that exists in this universe, but we also have life that replicates. Now, life replicates in a number of ways. Have you ever asked yourself the question, why is it that I was born? Why didn't I emerge like a mushroom does? Why didn't I just, like a spore goes into the ground and I just pop up out of the ground and here I am ready to go? Or, or why, unlike a, like a fruit of a tree, why wasn't I just grown on a tree? I reach the point where I'm heavy enough and then you know, my, my head pops off, well, my, my, head, my, my head pops off the tree, and then I fall to the ground, fully formed, ready to go. Why didn't it occur that way? Instead, what happens? You and I are created by a relationship between two individuals. And then we're born into a relationship. And sometimes that relationship's great, and sometimes it's less than great. But then the whole rest of our lives, we're in the process of seeking relationships and fostering relationships. And they're difficult, and we have to be careful. And sometimes we mess it up, and sometimes we do it right, and it feels right almost like we were created for relationship. But maybe not just relationship with one another, maybe we were created for one relationship 
one intentional relationship that many miss out on. We are life that is generated through familial reproduction. We are life that interacts with sensory equipment. We have the capacity to mingle with the outside world, and that's a big deal. Jellyfish don't have that. Rocks don't have that. We can engage with the outside world in a meaningful way. We are not just life that exists, but we are life that thinks. We have an understanding. Humans create these amazing tools. Humans interact in amazing ways, but we are not just life that thinks. We are a life that thinks about thinking. That is uncanny. There's nothing like that in the animal kingdom. We have the capacity not just to think, but to think about thinking, to imagine imaginings, to examine ourselves. We are observing the observer, and that is weird. Have you ever come to the horrifying realization that you exist? And I'm not kidding about that. Have you ever come to the point in your life where you stop and you go, whoa, I'm alive. I remember the first time this ever happened to me. I was probably five or six years old. I was at Mainville Elementary, right over there. This was back in the era where they did Christmas productions at school. And I was getting ready to go out on the stage. I was dressed as a shepherd standing off stage. And I remember standing there and suddenly, to my utter horror, I realized I am alive. I'm alive, I'm a living creature. I exist, I exist separate from these other creatures and I'm gonna die one of these days, but right now I exist and I'm in time and it was mortifying. I felt like I wanted to throw up. Have you had that experience? Maybe it's time you do if you, if you have not yet. I would call this a spirit waking up to the fact that it's in a body. That's what it seems to me. In philosophical circles, we call this an existential crisis. It's when you realize you're alive and you begin asking the deep and the hard questions. Most people spend their lives trying to avoid those questions. Not so with us. In an existential crisis, we ask questions like, why am I here? What is this place? What is my purpose? Does my life have any meaning? Does my life have enduring meaning? Is there some point to all of this? It's almost like we are crafted to think about purpose and meaning, almost as if there's purpose and meaning in the cosmos, and we're picking up on it and going, what is it about? What is my quest? What am I here for? And that's what I want to close out on today. I want to talk about the quest. We are all on a quest. How many of you have seen Monty Python and the Holy Grail? Oh, I am the, I'm in the right con congregation. If you have not, do so. It's important for your spiritual development. Psalm 104, and uh, really throughout the Psalms, we see something happening over and over again. The psalmists, and if you're not familiar with the Psalms, the Psalms are worship tunes, they're hymns, they're poems written to God or about God or about our circumstances. And in the Psalms, we see something happening over and over again. The psalmist oftentimes will turn to thoughts of the world in which we dwell in, and the psalmist begins talking about the world, and as the psalmist talks about the world, they begin worshiping. That's who we are. This is what should happen as we think about this world. Why something rather than nothing at all? As we look at the something, there should be something within us that goes, you are amazing. I know you're there. Do you remember the book of Job? If you've ever read through the book of Job, you know this. Job, Job has these massive tragedies that all fall on him. And at the front of the book, he experiences these tragedies. The, most, the bulk of the book is, is all him arguing with friends and talking to friends and debating with God and going, God, I want to confront you to your face. Why does this stuff happen? And if you paid attention to the book, here's what you know. God shows up at the end in a, in a thunderstorm, in this amazing storm. And does God answer Job's questions? God says to Job, where were you when I framed up the earth? Where were you when I spread out the heavens, when I laid out the measuring lines of earth and determined how big it would be and how it would move? Where were you? Have you ever walked on the floor of the sea? Do you know what that is? Tell me if you know. Do you know how the lion feeds itself? Do you know how the animals get their prey? Tell me if you understand, Job. And he begins asking Job the why questions and the how questions about this cosmos. Job's response is, I had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. There is something that happens in the revelation of God as we look into the world and we see that our creator, our good God, has made this and is making himself evident through it. 
the quest for meaning, we are all looking for truth, something to wrap our minds around that we go, that is real. The scriptures tell us, and if you would, turn your Bibles to uh, Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Paul's writing to the church at Rome, and the scriptures are very clear here. That every one of us, every one of us who has experienced the natural world knows that there is a God. Romans chapter 1, verse 20 through 25. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God, nor give him thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to become wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them over to the lust of their heart, to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is forever blessed. You see what this passage is saying? Every human being, every human being knows that there is a God. Anybody who has spent any amount of time thinking about this cosmos or engaging deeply with any aspect of this existence, you know that there's a God. But there are those, there are those who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They say, okay, no, uh, it's more, more interesting what's happening here. And they become obsessed with the creature rather than the creator. How can this happen? Philosopher George Barclay said this. I love this description. Listen and try to, try to glean this here. George Barclay. It is therefore plain that nothing can be more evident to anyone capable of the least reflection that the existence of God or a spirit which is intimately present in our minds, producing in them all the variety of ideas or sensations which continually affect us, on whom we have an absolute and entire dependence, in short, in whom we live and move and have our being. God exists. And then he says, The discovery of this great truth, which lies so near and obvious to the mind, should be attained to by the reason of so very few. The fact that it should be attained to by the reason of so very few is a sad instance of the stupidity and inattention of men, who, though they are surrounded with such clear manifestations of the deity, are yet so little affected by them that they seem, as it were, blinded with an excess of light." In other words, God is so present, God is so manifest that we get consumed with the light and we don't see past the light to what is causing it. We are not experiencing the creator because we're too enraptured with the creation. We are in a quest not just for truth, but we're in a quest for meaningful relationships. Turn to to Psalm 8, Psalm 8. A quest for meaningful relationships. If you're new to the Bible, open it up in the middle, excuse me, open the Bible up in the middle, that's the Psalms. (laughs) And look for chapter 8. Psalms 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, who have displayed the splendors of your heavens. Uh, From mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have established strength because of your adversaries to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you've made him a little lower than God, and you've crowned him with glory and majesty. You make him to rule over the works of your hands. You've put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The psalmist here is being absolutely amazed by God, and I hope that you've had this experience. He looks at the natural world, and he says, I am in awe. I'm stunned. Who am I that you care about me? Have you had this worship experience where you think about God and you see the the wonders of the created world and you go, why on earth would he be obsessed with me or interested in me? We're not just on a, not just on a quest for this relationship. We're not just on a quest for truth, but we are engaged in a quest for the uncanniest encounter. I, I had a first with Microsoft Word this past week. Microsoft Word, I typed in the most uncanny encounter. And Microsoft Word went, you meant the most, or the uncanniest encounter. So I went, okay, the uncanniest encounter. And then they went, that's not a word. (laughs) Thanks, Microsoft. Uh, We are looking for an encounter that we would call transcendent. 
it's not just that something that is here that we're looking for. We're looking for something that is greater than what is here, something beyond what we experience in the physical realm. This is what I would call the story of religion. Every culture that has ever existed has religious ideologies, religious ideas. And the quest seems to be we're reaching out for that which is beyond, something transcendent. And, and here's my assessment of world religions. Your arms are too short. You're reaching out for God, but your arms are too short. You will never be able to reach that God on your own. Enter Christianity. The God of this universe goes, I, I deem this is the case. You cannot get to me on your own. So I'm coming to you. And the God of the cosmos puts on flesh, humbles himself, and lives as one of us, yet without sin. He goes through the whole of this life. He teaches and leads and says, follow my example. Become like me. Become my disciple, my learner. And we come alongside him, but he didn't just teach us. He then offered himself as a ransom, as a sacrifice for you and I, so that the God of this universe could look at us and go, that person is sinless. God created a way, the quest if there is a quest, is given to us by the one who created us, the one who gave meaning. That is the one who showed up in time. That is the one who developed and established this quest that you and I are on to know our God. Here's the good news. This is amazing, right? It's uncanny. It's weird. The God who made this said, I'm going to destroy it. I'm going to obliterate all these things. They're going away. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 through 17. Here's what, here's what John says. Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And here he's not talking about the plan. He's talking about the people and things that are all focused on this stuff, this present age. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world. The world is passing away. It's going. It's going to be gone. The mountains that seem so permanent, they're going to be ground down to nothing. The seas will go away. This planet will go away. The entire cosmos is going away. But listen to this next phrase. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. You will outlive this planet and this whole cosmos. As great as all of this seems, the God of this universe says this is passing away, but you are permanent. Not only that, but I'm preparing something new, a more uncanny existence and you get to be part of it. Why something rather than nothing at all? You only got two options. Are we a colossal cosmic accident, or is there meaning and purpose behind everything? This is our quest to figure out. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Our Father, we praise you for making this universe. We praise you for creating a world in which we can know one another and know you, and struggle and have strife and difficulty and, and try to find purpose and meaning and the fact that you didn't leave us to just scramble around with our hands trying to figure out what that is on our own, but that you showed up and you showed us the way. You, the way, the truth, and the life. Lord, we love you. Give us meaning each and every day. Show us our quest and our path. It's in your most precious name we pray. The Lord of the great something. Amen.